So in this week's video, I will talk about distal radio ulnar joint instability and what we can do when we as radiologists sometimes face this question on a MRI scan or on a CT scan for that matter, whether the position of the ulna and radius in correlation to each other is abnormal or not. So let's first have a look at a typical scenario and then we'll see what we can do about it. Let's go. So this is typically the last case of every day. You see a, on a wrist MRI and then you have the impression that the ulna is dorsally subluxed and you are starting to wonder is this now a subluxation is this a sign of instability is it just normal is it just the position of the wrist in a scanner that's now showing this abnormal relationship here potentially and then you start to wonder right so the best next thing that people do is typically go to google type in distal radio ulnar joint instability uh, maybe measurement as well because we want to know how to measure stuff and then you either just go through one of these articles or you just go to images and you start to see very quickly that typically a illustration like this jumps up uh, where you can see these different methods, Mino method, congruency method, epicenter method, RUR method. You can see it's kind of like a scheme. It's always the same thing, right? Now, there's just one big problem. And the problem is that in about 50% of cases in these illustrations, the epicenter method is illustrated in a wrong way and this is even like really severe because even research articles original research is actually using the wrong method and so let me just show you how that actually is wrong and how that can happen in the first place and why we need to be very careful when we do any kind of like measurements like this so we need to really understand what's going on and not to fall into a trap and calling instability all over the place when in fact it's not the case now before i proceed just make sure you give the video a like and also subscribe to my youtube channel if you haven't already and now let's go and see what's going on this method here the illustration here is wrong and even this one is wrong so people are just copying uh, their own illustrations right so everybody gets it wrong or most of the people get it wrong there are some illustrations where it's correct like this one here so what is actually the problem and the reason for this we first have to understand how they come about this so let's assume we have the wrist in this position now the epicenter method goes like this so you draw a line from the center of the processus styloid or styloid process to the center of the ulna something like this then you make a line or you you half this so in the middle of this line you do a perpendicular thing so that's at least the wrong version so you go over and then you draw this perpendicular line through the line connecting the sigmoid notch now then you start to think about is this arrow now pointing up here there and and you can imagine how if this is going up then this starts to go up as well this arrow and this this would indicate instability what they didn't really realize is that you can move your hand and wrist so if you go from supination to neutral and pronation what happens is your relative position changes but with this method this arrow would always be more or less in the same direction right just by going from supination to something like pronation would result in a crazy amount of instability which doesn't make any sense so the real way this should be done is actually like this you still do these lines the yellow lines they stay the same but the line the arrow is not perpendicular to this line but it's actually perpendicular to the sigmoid notch line and then you can see you go from a perpendicular line to this line to the center of this other line here and this now makes sense because it's always pointing here in the center of the rotation meaning this is actually a stable situation right so what is this line here so the center or the center of rotation of the ulna itself is in the middle of these two circle or point so the center of the styloid process the center of the ulna right there in the middle this is where the rotation happens this makes sense because the arrow always points to the center of this rotation as it's rotating around it if that makes sense whereas here it's kind of like all over the place which doesn't make any sense at all so let's go here to one of a article that actually uses the epicenter method and compared it with the other methods here and you can see this is the journal of hand surgery i mean this is not kind of like a newbie paper or something like that uh, or artic uh, journal rather this is the paper in case you're interested i put the reference down below but let's go to the actual illustration so this is what we are interested epicenter method and you can see they draw the line exactly here like in all these other random google illustrations center of the styloid process is correct center to the here is fine the middle here this is where the rotation happens and then they draw the perpendicular line here and it's intersecting 
within the first 25 percent or within the you know the center 50 percent which is okay so that's considered stable now but if this patient rotates you know it, it would already be unstable it doesn't make any sense right so uh, this is wrong and then the conclusion in that study obviously was that the epicenter method was not very reliable and that their new method that they presented in this article was superior to this uh, yeah that's not a surprise right so let's have a look at an art other article here this one actually is about distal radio ulnar instability this is a, another article here, just some, some random article. And then you go down to the illustrations and you start to see, okay, what did they show here, epicenter method? And they actually, as you can see here, used the correct way. Center, center, line. And this time the line is not perpendicular to this line, but it's actually perpendicular to this line. And this is actually how it is. And as you can see, because it then rotates around, it always points into the center. And this is how it's supposed to be. Now, whenever you do research, um, this is kind of like a lesson that probably all of researchers know, you should always go and check the original reference and not just copy from some random guy or review article even. So let's do that. Let's go to the original reference where this was presented and you can see this uh, um, epicenter method was presented in a very old article skeletal radiology 1987 here and this was used on ct even so we can go to the illustration so this image here looks familiar so i use this as a reference based on this illustration you could easily think that they used the perpendicular line here but it's actually here so this is why there is a lot of confusion now the other thing is it gets even trickier because if you do take the time and go to the original reference and you then read the article and you go here. Okay, so how is the epicenter method done? So methods for assessing the subluxation, epicenter method there. A perpendicular line is drawn from the center of rotation of the distal radio ulnar joint, a point halfway between ulnar stilloid process and the center of the ulnar head. So halfway point, so this is actually this line in the middle here. So they even write it here that a perpendicular line is drawn from the center of rotation to the of the distal ulnar joint. So they even describe it actually wrong. And then if you go back here to the images that they show, you can see the line is not perpendicular to this line. It's actually perpendicular to this line. So this is very, very confusing. There is even a mismatch within this one article. Um, but based on the images, I would rely more on this. And maybe this is more like a understanding issue uh, here, this text where you can interpret this perpendicular line where it's going through and, and whatever. So. Yeah, but I think the illustrations here are quite obvious. So you can see it's not perpendicular. It's not perpendicular here. And this makes it uh, a better tool to assess this when you have pronation, supination, stuff like that. Um, yeah, so at least this is what I interpreted here. Yeah, so let's go back to our initial case here. And we see, you know, there seems to be a distortion subluxation. And we can now apply this different method. So we go to the center here of the head. Then we go here. Roughly here is the center of the ulna. Now we remember the center here of this line or the middle of this line. Then we do the lines maybe here, sigmoid notch. We can check the, the edges here. Maybe, yeah, it's not too bad. So we don't need the values for this matter. And then what we learned is to draw a line that's perpendicular uh, to this line, right? And then we just go through the center of this other line. And this is the 90 degrees angle. And then we basically need to subdivide this here into these different quadrants. And in a normal situation, this would fall within this central 50%. So that's the idea. And in this case, this would not account as unstable. It's roughly about 10, 50%. But there is quite a large overlap even if you go to the literature. So this brings us now to the conclusion of this video. Me personally, I don't measure any of these things. I don't use any of these methods on MRI specifically. The role of MRI is more to see what are the primary and secondary stabilizers doing. So assess the TFCC, assess all the ligaments and tendons, etc. that might contribute to this check osteoarthritis, degenerative changes, and all of that, and not necessarily try to find instability on a static image. If you really want to do specific imaging for this, there are articles that recommend doing either dynamic ultrasound, uh, because you can also compare the other side, and you can also do CT, bilateral CT, or maybe that would even work on MR with 
maximum supination and maximum pronation. And the advantage of that would be that you have always the contralateral potentially healthy side as comparison. And you will kind of like have an understanding of the baseline laxity that the patient might have. And any difference or any side difference is then the pathologic instability component, if you will. But yeah, so I don't really see this uh, very often and I hope that I'm not confusing everybody now with this video. Um, but if you are doing research, make sure you really take the time and not just copy some other person. Don't copy images from Google. Just go to the original reference and really try to find out how things are going. And I think this is really something uh, that this week video showed you that there is a lot of stuff that's not necessarily correct. And when we don't really understand why and what's happening, this might add a lot of confusion and people get just completely mixed up with stuff like this. So yeah, thanks for watching and I'm seeing you next week. Bye bye.